right around the corner. That's kind of exciting. I like the 4th of July. Uh, we've also had, in the American realm, the debates. Did anybody watch the debate? If you're laughing, you are probably watched the debate. It was um, kind of a train wreck, if we're perfectly honest. Um, it did not go well, particularly for either candidate. Um, but I think that if we began to watch it, we there was a point where I kind of wanted to turn it off, and Liz was like, "No, we got to we got to keep watching it." And I think a lot of us we we looked on with concern for our country. Um, and we wondered, why, why are we watching this in the first place? Like, why, why pay attention to a debate as a, amongst political candidates? And the answer is because leadership matters. Leadership matters. One of the things about leadership, and we, they do it in the debates, is they discuss hard topics, right? They talk about border control, foreign policies, abortion, um, the, ec the economy, climate change, all these things. Very important, difficult conversations that need to be had because leaders have to deal with and have to address difficult things. Well, I am a leader in the United Methodist Church and there is one big topic that has been in conversation for quite some time and I've not formally addressed it and today as a leader I have to do the hard thing. I want to begin today's message by giving you a summary of an email of a letter that we formally received from Eden Worship Center, which is a church in Topeka, pastored by Matt Gingrich. The email that I received was a plea to other pastors in the area pleading for them to encourage us as the United Methodist Church to stand on scripture and to separate from the United Methodist denomination. The letter stated that they had done this same action with the Anabaptist Church as they were going through a similar situation within their denomination. The email noted that if we chose not to disaffiliate and not to leave the United Methodist Church, that we as part of the Ivana Network churches would need to separate and go our separate ways and no longer be a part of this network. Other local area pastors responded to and agreed with the plea. In this request, however, the Eden Church also offered us the use of their facility if we were to choose to disaffiliate and it somehow resulted in the loss of our building to the conference. They wanted to make sure that we would still have a place to gather. With that synopsis of the email, I'll read you the former letter that he sent directly to the church and not to the pastors. So to our brothers and sisters at, in Christ at Shipshawan and Methodist, it is with a heavy heart that we watch the recent denominational vote 692 to 51 as the United Methodist Church to bow its knee to the escalating societal pressures of inclusion. Sadly, the church in general has done a very poor job of reaching out with the redemptive love of Christ for those caught in the snares of sin and instead have been angry, condescending, and dismissive. But while we are called to take the good news of Christ's salvation to all nations, inviting those from every nation, tribe, and people, and even to the outcast and the least of these, we dare not give unbiblical affirmation to those whose unrepented sin will lead them to hear from the lips of Jesus, then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. He then stated 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor rivalers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. He says, The hope of the gospel is that no matter what sin and bondage we're captivated by, the power of Christ is greater. 
our, privi- our privilege as the ecclesia is to call those in darkness to turn from their sin and to turn to the gospel of Christ, the power of God unto salvation. Our hearts grieve as we pray for you to Stanley firm, stand firm on the rock of Christ and his unchanging word in this trying time. Given the resolute determination of the United Methodist Church to subvert the word of God, we would lovingly, humbly, tearfully plead with you to separate yourselves from them as so not to fall under the same and certain condemnation. We cannot imagine how hard this moment must be for you, but know that there are brothers and sisters in Christ at EWC who love and who are praying for you. May God cause you to stand firm for the word of Christ and on his word. Signed, Senior Pastor Mark, Matt Gingrich and the EWC family. Now, I've had this letter for a few weeks, and a couple weeks ago I was like, it's Father's Day. Let's just let Father's Day be Father's Day. Right. Right. Sometimes you don't want to cover heavy subjects. It's not fun to get up here and to talk about an issue that's created so much division. None of that is fun, but sometimes leadership isn't fun. Sometimes you have to do the hard thing. So with that said, what's the big deal? Right? What's the big deal? Why have 7,659 United Methodist churches chosen to disaffiliate? since 2019. Why have over 300, I believe it's 317 to be exact, Indiana churches chosen to disaffiliate? Why are we getting letters from other churches encouraging us to disaffiliate? Why are vital members of this congregation, one whom I deeply loved, left the United Methodist Church after being a United Methodist for 70 years? years leaving in tears because she's being ripped apart by her convictions and she's having to break off away from friendships that she's held dear for so long. Why? Why is it a fireable offense if I was to try to directly influence you to disaffiliate? Why has this issue been in debate for the last 40 years within the United Methodist Church? Why all of the divisiveness? Why? Because this is a big deal. This is a really big deal. I know to some of us it doesn't seem like this matters all that much. We're just a small church, few in numbers, and we can choose to love our neighbor and continue on. We can keep our heads down and do ministry and be passive and carry on like things have been done the last hundred years. Or so we think. The problem is leadership matters. Direction matters. If you're on par for a course and your trajectory is right, you will get there even if it takes a while. But if your trajectory is off by even the slightest degree, Over the course of time, you will get further and further and further away from your destination until you choose course correct. The United Methodist Church has set the coordinates in the GPS and they've put in the wrong coordinates. UMC is on course for a long, disastrous trip. And this message is being recorded, I'm well aware, and it may very well get me fired. Speaking outwardly outwardly and openly against the denomination that employs me, that's not going to be tolerated for long, I'm sure. Rightfully so, they should remove me. Right? If If that's what it takes, it's what it takes. I spoke out once, I got silenced and moved, and I won't make that mistake twice. I won't be silent. Fire. I'm going to lead people in the right direction. I am going to lead people towards truth. I am going to lead people towards Jesus. Is homosexuality a sin? Yes. Are people who openly embrace sin, any sin, right? That list, there's a lot of sins. We're not singling out homosexuality. Are people who openly embrace sin supposed to be in the pulpit no 
Are we supposed to accept sin? Is it okay? No. Are we to endorse it? No. So why has the United Methodist Church taken that as its path? If God calls homosexuality an abomination and a shameful lust, why are we endorsing it? Not only are we endorsing it, but we are putting people who live it in leadership positions. And the funny thing about leadership positions within the church is that those people who are in leadership positions, they're supposed to be leading. And they are. Just not always in the right direction. If I am in a position within leadership, which I am, if I fall to sin, am I supposed to endorse it? No. Dismiss it? No. Embrace it? No. Continue on in it? No, absolutely not. I am to repent. I am to seek Jesus, look to change, pray to God that he not let me fall again and give me the self-control to, to stray away from the temptation and to go in the other direction and to fall at his feet. That's personable, a personal accountability and repentance and seeking after God and His standard. Not my standard, whatever I want that to be, His standard. The world can say that I'm being hateful, unloving, bigoted, whatever. I know the truth. I know that I am not those things. I just got back from a gaming convention in Columbus, Ohio, a very liberal city. I was there for four days. There were gay pride banners, flags, ribbons, community members, advocates, allies, transvestites, everywhere. I felt like I was in the minority, honestly. But I, with that said, I spent three and a half hours in the gay pride room playing with an open homosexual around the same table. I spent another several hours playing games with a gentleman who referred to his longtime fiance as they them. And I still have no idea if his longtime fiance was a male or a female. I don't hate this community. I witnessed guys in dresses, guys in fishnet tights and high heels. Of course, this was a little bit of a culture shock. You, this, this is conservative northern Indiana. You don't necessarily see that around here very much. But I don't hate this community. But putting the gay community within church leadership, that's a big deal. Again, I'll ask you, is homosexuality a sin? Yes. With that said, Jesus engaged with sinners. He sat with the tax collectors and he said, give back what you've taken. He met the woman at the well who was caught in prostitution and he said, go and leave your life and sin no more. He found me and he found you in our own adulterous states with lustful relationships of our own sinful desires. And he called us out of sin and into righteousness. And he told you and I to go into sin no more. Jesus never once said, you're a sinner. Stay exactly as you are. Continue on in your way of sin. And in fact, I want you to lead my church. Not once. This is why this is a big. There is a standard in which God wants his leaders to uphold. And it's written down in 1 Timothy 3, and I will read this standard for you. Here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectful, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner full of respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that when he might not fall to disgrace and into the devil's traps. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, 
not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith in a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and a great assurance in their faith in Jesus Christ. Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that, if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of truth. Beyond all questions, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, he was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preaching amongst nations, and was believed on the world, and he was taken was believed on in the world and was taken up in glory. When we read this standard written here in this book and we put it directly against me, would you want me to lead you if I wasn't above reproach? If I was unfaithful to my wife and I was stepping out of her and living in an open relationship, what if I was a rageaholic, rude, drunk, and someone who only loved money and was only arguing all the time? I was disrespectful to all of you and anybody who came in that door. And you could clearly see that I couldn't raise my kids right. No, you wouldn't want me as your pastor. You wouldn't want a pastor whose life doesn't reflect the fruit of Christ in their own. Now, am I perfect? Absolutely not. I make mistakes. I'm not here to judge anyone. I'm not trying to be self-righteous or holier than thou. I am just a person like unto everyone else. The difference is that the United Methodist Church is no longer asking people in leadership to turn away from the sin of homosexuality. They are no longer asking their leadership to be above reproach. If I was to say you can be a drunk and still be a pastor in the United Methodist Church, you would all think that I'm crazy. If I was to say you can openly cheat on your wife and have an open relationship and still be a United Methodist pastor, you would say that I was crazy. If I was to say you could murder someone every single day or go to the department store and steal from them every single day and still be a pastor of the United Methodist Church, you would say that I'm crazy. All of those things sinful, again, uh, among a list of many other things. But here we are saying it's okay to be sinful and lead a United Methodist Church. People want to say that we're being discriminate against homosexuality. No, we're not. We're being discriminate against sin. Homosexuality just happens to be the sin that the world and Satan is convincing the church is okay. But did God really say that homosexuality is a sin? Because that's where the deceit begins. Just like in the Garden of Eden, a twisting of words and an introduction of doubt. Did God really say? The so-called scholars will say that any language in the Bible surrounding homosexuality was mistranslated. It didn't really say that homosexuality was an abomination. It only said that homosexuality without consent was a sin. Consensual homosexuality is completely okay. News to those people, that's not what my Bible says. I still know how to read and I'm not going to be convinced otherwise. I'm sorry to everyone who is tired of hearing about this issue. I am probably more tired of hearing about it than any of you because I get it from above my head. I really didn't want to ever have to preach on this message again. But here we are. And if God says it was time for me to speak on it again, I'll speak on it again. As a reminder, this message could get me fired. I've had over 15 jobs in my life. I've never been fired from a single one. And in fact, I've been promoted at most of them. But if this was the first job I was ever to get fired from, from doing my job and for standing on the word of God, I would be proud and I would go to bed peacefully and not even bat an eye. Although the passage Pastor Matt Gingrich chose to share with us is a tough one to swallow, it is in the Bible and it is truth. 
Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, or adulterers, or men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, or drunkards, or slanders, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you are washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. It doesn't get much clearer than this here. There is a pursuit of righteousness that we need to go after. We cannot preach from the pulpit the, pulpit, the opposite of this message, which would read something like this. Wrongdoers will inherit the kingdom of God. Those who are sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, thieves, greedy people, drunkards, slanderers, swindlers, they'll all get in. You can stay the same. There is no need for sanctification or justification through Jesus Christ. Stay where you are. Love is love. You guys, it has started with homosexuality. An area... What area of unrighteousness will be openly accepted next? This is why other churches don't want to be affiliated with us any longer. This is why I told my direct superior that I'm not sure if I want to be affiliated or employed with United Methodist Church any longer. This is a turbulent time in the United Methodist Church because the upper echelon of the United Methodist Church has gone the way of the world. Not only that, but it is being widely celebrated. Our district superintendent, Russ Abel, made the announcement that the language had officially been removed from the discrimination of the LGBTQIA plus community from our discipline at one of the conferences, I believe it was annual, and it was met by a sea of applause. To an applaud and enablement of sin, that is dangerous territory. Again, I don't hate homosexuals. I pray every homosexual on this planet steps foot into a church. I have pastored homosexuals who respected me even after I told them that they were living a sinful lifestyle when the moment was right. And after these moments, they continued on living out their sinful lifestyle and I continued to love them exactly where they were. But I sure as heck wasn't going to be so unloving as to say, continue on in your sinful ways. Absolutely nothing is wrong here. And in fact, if you want to lead a congregation into sin, we've got a spot for you. Dear Heavenly Father, I've spoken some pretty hard, blunt, maybe harsh words words of rebuke against those in authority above my head that could cost my job. But Lord, I am here to stand on your truth. I am here to stand on your word. Whatever the cost. Lord, I pray you would give everyone in here that same conviction. I pray that you would lead us and guide us and direct us. Teach us how to love our neighbors and our community well regardless of what sin they may be entangled in. Lord, you loved me while I was yet a sinner. You loved us all while we were yet sinners. You died for us, Lord. You, you still love us. Even when we fall, you still love us, Lord. But you also love us enough to say, go and sin no more. Don't do that again. Lord, I pray for the direction of this church. Lord, I pray for the direction of our country. I pray for the direction, God, with an earnest heart. Show us, lead us, guide us, direct us back into your loving arms. Give us hearts that fear you more than man. In your name I pray. Amen.